As far as I'm concerned, um, the aim of my paper will, will be um, to show three major enculturation areas of what we call um, the, an understanding, the Christian understanding of creation. And I will do it from a Pan-African uh, perspective. I understand Pan-Africanism as the ideological movement whose aim is to unite Africans and uh, African descent, so African from, from the diaspora, for the sake of defending their interests. So, and I consider Pan-Africanism to be the most influential narrative in contemporary uh, Africa. A narrative that impacts contemporary uh, cultures, African cultures and subcultures, and which can be an efficient ally in the commitment for a sustainable and integral ecology in Africa and above. Considering that sustainability is key to all present, future, state, continental, continental and international uh, policies, I argue that a dialogue with the Christian claim for responsibility towards creation, as stated in the encyclical um, Laudato Si and in documents of the theological, uh, International Theological Commission, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the Pan-African concern if we can really have a dialogue between those two teachings, then it can foster a more efficiency, more efficiency in sustainability uh, policies. And in the following minutes, I would like to show you why many African sustainability policies failed or are not sufficient or efficient enough. Why? And after that, I'd like to engage in a, in a kind of dialogue between, on the one hand, the, uh, the, the, the Christian understanding of creation and the meaning, the meaning of responsibility, Christian responsibility to creation on the one hand and Pan-Africanism on the other hand. And I will finish by pointing out three major enculturation areas. So first of all, why do African answers to sustainability fail most of the time? Or why are they not efficient enough? That's the first question. I would like to show you, first of all, three case studies. The first case study comes from Chad. And especially, you know, Chad is a country in the Central Africa, uh, surrounded by Libya in the north, uh, Sudan, Central African Republic, Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, and Niger. I would like to talk about the Lake Chad. As you can see on this, on this map, uh, the Lake Chad in the 60s were 25,000 square kilometers, the size of this, of this lake. And nowadays, so 2007 and, and, uh, and after 2007, we have only 1,350 square kilometer. That's a real, a concrete consequence of drought desertification. And 2012, our president, the late president Idris Deby Itno, went to the water summit in Marseille, and there he got a lot of fund for saving the Lake Chad. That was one of the names of the projects. Until today, nobody knows where the fund went, disappeared in the nature. So you can understand that one of the major causes of failure in fight against desertification, uh, climate change, climate change is bad governance. And secondly, uh, there is also another, another reason. It has been said that people wanted to, in the project, there were a project to fill uh, the lake chat with water from the, from the Congo, the Congo River. But the Congolese said, no, 
it will disturb our ecosystem. So we don't agree to, to give you our water from the, Congo, from the Congo River. So this is another reason why um, yeah, climate change policy strategies fail. There is not enough cooperation between African, uh, African countries. The second study case is the Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia. You certainly heard about this uh, project to build on the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile is over there uh, in red. A great dam in order to foster the development, economic development of Ethiopia. But Egypt and Sudan are not happy with this project because it means their own ecosystem will change as well. And they, it will, they will have tremendous uh, bad consequences on their social life, uh, um, economic life, and so on. So they didn't, they didn't agree with this project, and Egypt is even ready to wage war against Ethiopia if it continues like this. So there is no, not enough cooperation between African countries, sometimes for good reasons. Now, another case is the NEPAD. Maybe you heard about the new partnership for African development. It also actually failed. It has been replaced by the African Union Development Agency. Why? Because most of the time, uh, the, the, the whole project was dependent on external foreign fin finance. So they, they have been a finance, uh, finance shortage. But the ideas, the concept of this project itself was actually a foreign character. It came from abroad. It was not something that grew from an African spirit, let us say it like this. So we have already one solution, at least a way to, a way to, to, to find the first solution, namely African problems should be solved by Africans, first and foremost. What does, it, what does I mean? I want just to say with Fabien Eboussi Boulaga that if we want, as Africans, to solve our own problems, we don't have to relate on others to save these problems. We have first and foremost to relate on ourselves. And there is a very important uh, freedom movement, actually, ideology, which is very influential nowadays in Africa. It is called Pan-Africanism. And Pan-Africanism, as I said, is one of the most influential movements in contemporary Africa. It has a great impact on African cultures, urban cultures, contemporary cultures, subcultures. Um, it binds diverse, different people like Marcus Garvey, you might know him, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Kwame Krumah, Thomas Sankara, Nelson Mandela, all those are considered, considered as heroes of Pan-Africanism. So, and they have this ideology in common. And this ideology is nowadays changing Africa. Uh, if you, are, um, if, if you, you, you see the, uh, what, what is going on in the Sahel Zone, for example, actually the youth there are very much influenced by Pan-Africanism. So, as I said, Pan-Africanism influences contemporary culture. But what is the understanding, the underneath understanding of culture which is uh, operating here? Yeah. I understand here culture as a tool, as a tool to transform. But first and foremost, I understand it in a semiotic way with uh, Clifford Gers. Human beings are agents of their cultures by giving meaning to their environment. So if they succeed, actually, to give meaning to their environment according to the challenges of, of environment, of sustainability, it can really foster help people to change 
concrete, to, come, to, to let come about concrete change. So let us go further and say that the African youth, who is very much convinced by the ideology of uh, Pan-Africanism, they can change the situation uh, concretely if we enculturate somehow ideas of responsibility, the Christian idea of responsibility towards the creation. Let us say that this is not new, actually, in Pan-Africanism. Maybe you know this, this woman, Wangari uh, Matai, a Nobel Prize, Kenyan. She, is, she was very much committed uh, to, with her project on uh, the Green Belt project in Kenya. But actually, what many didn't know, don't know, is that the project, the proposal of the Green Belt in the Sahel Zone came from this man. He is a Pan-African, Toma Sankara, the former president of Burkina Faso, one of the major figures, figures of political figures of, of Pan-Africanism on the continent. He died many years ago, in the 80s, but until now, his spirit is still living. He's influencing, actually, is a model for the youth uh, today. What did he say? Thomas Sankara said that in the 80s, that uh, um, he was a very, very much aware of the climate change. And he said that humanity is facing an ecological catastrophe. And he, and he emphasizes that what's ecological system where interdependent in the 80s, interdependent, that devastating the Amazon today has consequences in our Burkina Faso. The Amazon is in Latin, Latin America. Burkina Faso is in Africa, in the heart of Africa. But destabilizing the Amazon has direct consequences on Burkina Faso. And he says, he continues, uh, there is a need for an intra-African solidarity, which is very important. If African people are not, uh, they, they do not uh, they say together, they will never let change come about. So African unity is a necessity, he says, and no longer simply a choice. He proposed a 15 kilometer wide green belt across the Sahel zone the Sahel region as a concrete measure in order to contain the advance of desert. Unfortunately, he's been killed uh, some years later, so he couldn't uh, uh, continue, I mean, pursue this project. But as I said, the spirit remained, and even the African Union uh, uh, took this project and until today uh, tries to, to implement it. There is indeed uh, an, African, an African Union strategy, a very clear environmental for environmental sustainability. And it is focused on agricultural transformation, on the one hand, firstly, then on environment and climate change, secondly, and renewable energy and food security. So the African Union considers those three major challenges as belonging together. Uh, one cannot uh, make uh, uh, a commit themselves to, uh, against climate change when there is food shortage, when people are, are starving, uh, and with, when there is no energy, there is no industry, and there is no wealth for the country, and poverty, uh, when there is poverty, there is no need, actually, uh, to, to, light, to, to fight for, 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 for climate change, for, for, for the environment, since the first priority is to live. The first priority is to live. So nowadays, uh, Pan-Africanism, as it is influential, it can be really a, an, a, an ally in the, in the fight against uh, climate change for an uh, integral environment. Um, integral ecology. But there is a problem. Pan-Africanism 
is very much against Christianism. And that's a great problem, especially one of the very uh, religious um, orientations of Pan-Africanism are very much against Christianism. This religious orientated um, um, branch or orientation of, of Pan-Africanism is called Kemetism. Kemetism. Kemetism is against Christianity and sees Christianity as the religion of the former colonizer. That Christianity was actually a tool, a mean to colonize the soul of Africans. And they promote, rather than Christianity, they promote traditional African religions as the a genuine and original African, relig uh, African religions, which have their roots in ancient African, in ancient Egypt, sorry, uh, religion. And they have, they have uh, even a, a spirituality, ecology spirituality. They say there is a spiritual ecology which is essentially the law of reciprocity and governs the interchange between human relationships, asking the question, what am I taking in? What am I giving out? In spiritual ecology, they say, members of the ecosystem on all levels have a part to play in maintaining mat. Mat is the key, the key, um, the key word here. Mad can be translated as the principle of justice. The justice, principle of justice that, that keeps harmony in cosmos, in the cosmos. So we can say, we can see that there is actually in Pan-Africanism an ecological sensibility, but this ecological sensibility is somehow against Christianity. Bye-bye they can learn a lot from Christianity. And Christianity can also learn a lot from them. And that's, this is where I see the dialogue. And this dialogue and understanding it as enculturation. For me, I define enculturation with Teones Keramigo, who, which is a, who is a, he is a, a, a theologian and philosopher from Rwanda, and uh, with Michael Amaladas from, uh, from India, as an encounter of cultures. Enculturation is first and foremost an encounter of culture. We have no pure message, Christian message, who is coming down into a culture. The Christian message comes always in a culture and encounters another culture. In this meaning, we can understand uh, enculturation as an encounter of culture in order to to proclaim the gospel. The gospel as something that transforms culture from within. So understanding enculturation like this, we can notice that in the, in the, in the teaching of the church, especially um, in Gaudium at space 12, Gaudium at, at, at uh, space at 22, but also in the document communion and stewardship, human person human persons created in the image of God, but also in, in Laudato Si, as we heard this morning, this day, um, human persons are created in the image of God in order, one, to enjoy personal communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with one another in them, with one another, and also to exercise, and which is uh, the, the, very, the most important uh, point I want to make here, it, but also to ex exercise in God's name responsible stewardship of the created world. Uh, responsible stewardship of the created world, Genesis 1, 28, but especially Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, 1 to walk it and to, to keep it. Work and keep it. And human beings can freely cooperate in God's creative work because they are the only living beings that God, um, uh, God endowed with intelligence, a free will, and the power to love. God made them 
in his image so that they would be co-workers, co-workers, co-operators, co-workers in his work of creation. So the teaching of the church related to creation as far as the responsibility of the human person, the human being are concerned, is to take responsibility for the creation. We are responsible for this creation. And by doing this, our dignity is clear. I mean, this is an expression of our dignity, to be created in the image of God, to be his stewardship, to, to be his cooperators. And human person has the power over all other creatures. Yes, he's powerful, but, but for the sake of preserving the creation. And from this one, we can, we can from this uh, a dialogue between, uh, uh, from this understanding of Christian teaching of responsibility towards creation, we can recognize three major areas of enculturation. The first one is actually in the title, uh, connectedness. Connectedness. Everything is connected. Actually, the first time I heard, I, I read Laudato Si and I heard about this, I said, oh, is this a genuine Christian idea? Or is it a pagan idea that the Pope took into the church? Because in all, in many, I mean, in all African uh, traditional religions, it is clear. The humankind, the human person is connected to the cosmos. He is part of the cosmos. He is not uh, apart from this cosmos. He is, he is, he is really a part of, of this cosmos. So it, it, is, it is an evidence, actually. And the Pope understood it from the Christian point of view. This is, for me, a very important area of enculturation where many discussions, I mean, we can do many researches on, on this, and even Kemetism is there, uh, is part of this discourse. Kemetism says, through math, through the principle of justice, harmony between the, the, all the creatures or all the, all the beings is possible. And this is the aim, actually, of life, creating Mount. And uh, in his latest, his latest book, uh, The Earthly Community, Achille Mbembe said that, argues that traditional African religions cultivate values that are important for environmental protection and communal life in general. To this end, it is important to listen to the needs of the word and the act and act accordingly. The second area is that Christ is the Christian contribution to the autonomy, autonomy concern of Pan-Africanism. As I said, Pan-Africanists are looking at Christianity in a very suspicious way. So Christianity, Christians have to, I mean, to prove or to show that they are concerned with the key concerns of Pan-Africans, namely to be uh, the, the, the yearn of, to, for autonomy. Uh, from, uh, I mean, this is an understanding, this is a challenge that comes from the history of black people, uh, uh, beginning from the slave trade to the colonization, to the new colonization. This is a, very, a, major, a major point, a major concern in Pan-Africanism. But did Christianity only, was Christianity only on the side, on the other side, on the wrong side? No, because many of the Pan-Africanists were themselves Christians. Yeah. Wilmot Blyden, he was a pastor. He is one of the major intellectuals uh, who thought the idea uh, the reality of or the, uh, uh, the, uh, this, this very important uh, a key word of Pan-Africanism, which is Ethiopianism. He was a pastor. He was a pastor. 
And the idea of the dignity of human being, it comes from Christianity somehow. So Christianity was not only on the wrong side. Christianity was also on the side of the Pan-Africanists. And we have to show that in order to come close to Pan-Africans. And the third area is that Pan-Africanism, out of this dialogue with Christianity, can come to a critical self-awareness. Self-awareness. Most of the time, Pan-Africanists are reactive rather than active. Reaction because of the historical wounds African went through, uh, the, the, the historical uh, yeah, wounds African uh, got through the history. But they have to go further than that and, and act because transformation will come about when there are action, there is action. Uh, so culture can be changed. And I think, I think that the church has, that Pan-Africanism has a lot to learn from the church, from Christianity, especially from its teaching um, uh, related to responsibility to creation, because it is an integral one. Integral ecology, which means fighting for freedom, fighting for justice, fighting for the common good, it goes along with fighting for an integral ecology. Thank you very much.